Brad. Well, it is so good to see each of you this morning and to welcome you here uh, as we are worshiping the Lord together in Forest Lake Baptist Church. In addition to welcoming those of you who are here present, I want to say welcome, of course, to those who are present with us online. Uh, we have begun to speak of our online campus, and so just want to uh, say that we appreciate each of you uh, as you join us uh, on the internet each week. <clears throat> and speaking of that, I need to talk just a little bit about things coming up this month. Now, this is not part of the sermon. Don't worry about that. Uh, but Here's what we're going to do, just to be sure everyone knows, okay? Uh, as of this morning, just to kind of set this up, uh, 31 of our members and two of our staff members have had COVID. And so we don't announce those names. We don't publish that list. And the word kind of gets around in the church family, so to speak. But you want to be want you to be in prayer for those individuals, of course, and those families. And we're highly conscious of the season, not just the Christmas season, but the season that we are in uh, as a result of this disease. So what's going to happen this year with Christmas Eve? We've been asked that several times. Here's what's going to happen on Christmas Eve. We are going to pre-record the Christmas Eve service and it will be available online starting about midday on Christmas Eve the 24th and so we will encourage you to go ahead and participate in that service at home your family who is with you or if you are there uh, by yourself and want to observe that that is that is okay but we're going to do that virtually what that means is there will not be a gathering here on Christmas Eve. Okay? Now, to prepare for that, we have ordered, uh, because the Lord's Supper is part of that, we have ordered a supply of the Lord's Supper uh, elements, the juice and the wafer, and a little self-contained cup. And Donnie Patrick and I will be doing uh, a lesson on how to open that cup without losing your wafer, okay? Uh, we, we, and it's, listen, it's gluten-free. Go ahead and tell you that for all of our uh, diet-conscious and gluten-conscious folks that are here in the room or out there with us in the online campus. It's gluten-free. But we do need for you to do this beginning tomorrow. You may come by the church office between 9 and noon, and if you need just one serving, or if you need five servings for your family, whoever will gather, we will, uh, they're sanitary, of course, we'll handle those with gloves, but we will put those in a Ziploc bag for you. And then next Sunday, at the conclusion of worship, uh, we will also have uh, hostesses or servers, however we, whatever word we want to put on it, available, and you can pick those up on the way out to do this at home on Christmas Eve. Okay, and so I know that I'm giving you this news, looking at you, and I can see most of you, and the Christmas Eve service is a high point for all of us. Uh, I have a story I'll tell you about that. My first... Uh, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm so tired of this watch. You don't need to hear me. <laughs> and I have it on mute. I have it on mute. My, my phone, that part of it is over in the office. If you don't be quiet, I'll put you inside that pulpit with that roll of toilet paper. <laughs> Some of you don't believe me, do you? <laughs> okay. Where was I? The first holiday weekend I was at Holt. We come up on planning Labor Day weekend. How, and I asked the question in the church council, how many should we expect? Oh, we'll have people here, you know, and everything. Had six faithful, wonderful people. We came up on the Sunday night of Thanksgiving week, 
And I didn't ask the question, how many will we have? I made a decree. I said, we're going to grant a guilt-free Sunday night off to those six people. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and so we actually had a discussion. Alicia, raise your hand. She was part of this at one point with us out there where we said, all right, we're going to identify the guilt-free Sunday nights and Wednesdays. And that's how we did it through the year. Came up to Christmas Eve. I asked the question, all right, now, is this going to be well attended or is it going to be the same six people that need a, a guilt-free night off? Oh, it'll be a full house. Okay. I mean, it was packed. And it snowed that night. Some of y'all, some of y'all remember that. Forest Lake probably remembers that. This would have been like Christmas Eve 2010. Had a great time. I want you to understand, it pains me to stand here and say, we will not do the Christmas Eve service on site. But it's what we believe we need to do in the interest of the health of the church body. Okay? So that's where it is. That's it for the announcements and explanations. And that's probably half the time I have for the sermon. All God's people said, Amen. and you be quiet. <laughs> Stand, please. We're going to read from the Scriptures. In Luke 17, beginning in verse 7, and then I will also read from Matthew's Gospel as we will talk about servanthood. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, Come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, Prepare my supper and get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Now in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, there's a passage that fills in some things that Jesus' disciples were dealing with. He knew those fellows well. In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other on your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant. They were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. May our Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. <clears throat> we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. The words of Jesus as he spoke to his disciples about servanthood. Now people in general understand the often subtle but sometimes blatant issues of status. People are, we're conscious of it at a very early age. One of my favorite stories about one of my daughters is when she was about four, we were out to dinner one night after church. One day this will happen that we can do this again, I'm confident. And we look over and we had the kids at a separate booth where we could keep our eye on them. And we looked over and, and my daughter had her head down on the table like this. And I went over and said, what's wrong? And, and she said, we voted to see who was going to be boss. And she named the other one who won. Okay. As early as four or five, 
we just have this human tendency to understand matters of status. And so we also find that as Americans that this runs against the grain, not just of human nature, but of our national character. We are by nature a ruly and unruly and independent type of people. You see, a long time ago, for all of us seated in this room and many of you listening, our forefathers left some other place to come here. And when they left coming here, this is what happened. There were people standing on the piers, dabbing their eyes, and they're saying, you're going to die over there. And our forefathers are saying, yeah, we are. We know that. They'd made peace with that. The boat might sink and you might die on the way. Yeah, that might happen. But that's preferable to stay in here in this servitude where we are. Now, I don't know that the conversation went exactly like that, but it could have well gone like that because the pier people stayed on the other side. And the boat people, that's us, our forefathers came here. And then they got off the boat in North Carolina or Virginia or wherever they were, and they began traveling out across this land, and they established communities, well, homes and communities and businesses and churches and schools. This is our history as a people, as Americans. And I want you to know that after the people got together and they had a store, what is the first thing they did? They built a church. And the school met in the church. And I would agree with it may have been Billy Graham or it may have been Dr. David Jeremiah or, or Ravi Zacharias or somebody else. But the comment was made that the further education in America has moved from the church house, the closer it has gotten to the outhouse. And it has, we are seeing some of the results of that today with people that don't know our history and do not understand our character. Went to a conference at the Baptist Associational Office, I don't know, five, six years ago, ten years ago, and there was this individual there talking about forestry in America. And he said, I'll have you know in the year 1900 that a squirrel on the east coast of the United States could have left heading west and there was enough old growth trees standing in this country that he could have gone from the east coast of the United States to the Mississippi River and never have to come down to the ground. And he's telling the truth. But unruly character that I raised my hand and said, Sir, I said, I'm from Hell County, Alabama, and if he'd passed through there, we may have shot him and ate him. <laughs> you know, just keeping it real. But I want you to understand that our forefathers who left servitude got on horseback and they walked and they rode in wagons out across this country when there were no roads, no fences, no place to stop and eat. They cut a path across this country out west. When I stopped out west in 2010 on the motorcycle trip, there's one of the epic opportunities of my life there's a cabin in the middle of nowhere out there on the in, in Wyoming kind of in the tree line it's an old log cabin that has not yet rotted down and it's there and my buddy asked me he said why in the world would somebody stop here and build a cabin and I said I'll tell you why because a long time ago there was a young guy with his wife and two children and another one on the way that stopped at this place. And he said, well, we'll stay here for the night, but I'm not sure this is it. And he was looking around. His wife said, no, this is it. <laughs> he, he said, what do you mean? He said, no. She said, no, this is it. We left Ohio 18 months ago with carrying with me, holding one baby in my arm and expecting another. And now I'm carrying two in my arms. We got another on the way. We're stopping here. This is it. And that's how some of those decisions were made when we settled this country. But here's what I want you to understand. Servitude runs against everything in the American character. 
William Manchester was White House historian under John Kennedy, and he tells this story in his book, The Glory and the Dream, big, thick, two-volume boat anchor type of, of work, but a really good read. He said that during World War II, the American spies were continually getting caught on the European continent. He said the British spies walked as if they owned the world. The French spies walked as if they feared whoever owned the world. And the American spies walked as if they didn't care who owned the world. And in the context of that historical character, Jesus says, count yourself unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. The gospel runs against human nature, and it runs against our American national character in remarkable ways. But Jesus spoke plainly to his disciples about servanthood. So what, what can we draw from this? First of all, servanthood assumes that someone is greater and the other is lesser. And we need to keep this in mind because there's only one Lord of the church. In Colossians 1, beginning in verse 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things are created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him, that is Jesus, all things hold together. I want you to understand in the midst of this pandemic, we hold together spiritually and emotionally and socially and organizationally. We hold together because of Jesus who is our personal Lord and the one Jesus who is Lord of the church. He is before all things the greater. And in Him all things, the Scripture says, hold together. And Paul goes on. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether the things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus, the one who said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many is the one who calls us to servanthood. He calls us to servanthood. And so what are we to make of that? Well, first of all, as Matthew reminded us so vividly, no one goes to the head of the heavenly line based on their earthly status. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And I would argue that most of the problems we encounter in life and in church go back to human selfishness and the desire to be first, be recognized, be imported, exercise power, the desire to be at the head of the line, looking back on everybody and say, I got here first. Doesn't work that way in the kingdom of God. And so we need to be realistic about servanthood. It may mean we get very little rest. It's what he indicated there in Luke's gospel. I can kind of identify with a little bit of this from when I was in high school, junior high and high school, and my dad was an interesting taskmaster. He grew up old school. In fact, his family was one of those families that rode out across the country on horses and, uh, and that was part of the family story about how they settled and all that. But it didn't matter how tired we were. If we had chores to do around the house, it was like, boy, get it done. Some of you have heard this one like I have. Boy, don't make me have to get up out of this chair. Now, he's already in a chair. I want to be in a chair. It's like, get it done. Okay. And, and so Jesus spoke to this. He said, in servanthood, we might not get a lot of rest. And so how are we to deal with that? Well, there are two analogies that come to me as I think about the fact that 
life can bring us pleasant things or difficult things. One is the conveyor belt and the other is a merry-go-round. You know what a conveyor belt is. It just brings stuff to us. My favorite memory of a conveyor belt is the old service merchandise warehouse down on Skyland Boulevard where the Beauty Mark store is now. You know, you walked around through the store. This was the first store of its type in Tuscaloosa where you could walk around and look at all the, all the stuff that was there. But you write down the number and you go pay for it. And you don't take the one you see on the shelf. You take the one they bring you on the conveyor belt. And so then we're all standing back there, you know, as we shop there, eight or ten people, 25 people at Christmas. It'd be a mob full of people. And, and so we can hear that thing clanking in there. And employees are working and things would come rolling down that, that chute. And we'd who's is that? You know, is that yours? And we're looking for the number and everything. Come on, how many of you remember this? The rest of you haven't lived, okay? I'm telling you, you haven't Christmas shopped until you've been to service merchandise. Well, you know, that conveyor belt represents circumstances in life. Circumstances bring us things that are pleasant and things that are unpleasant. And the other one that speaks to me is a merry-go-round. You know, that carnival deal that goes around and around and around. And some of you felt a slight nausea in the pit of your stomach when I said the word merry-go-round. Because, you know, for a few minutes it can be fun. But after a while, you start kind of feeling this wooziness in your head, and it's like, where am I, and who am I, and how do I get off of this thing? Well, you can't just jump off. have to wait till it stops. And so life is a little bit like that, and servanthood is a little bit like that. There are times in servanthood when the things that come to us are very pleasant, and there are other times when life circumstances come to us and they're very difficult. But we stay the course. And then that merry-go-round that represents time. There are times when we'd like to jump off. But we can't do that either. Not without great injury. Now the analogy breaks down. Of course, you understand that, but you also understand what I'm saying. That we have to be willing through our faith in Christ to just step up and embrace whatever circumstances and time brings to us as we serve Him. And then, that verse that we are reminded of tells us, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into what? Your rest. There will come a time when we rest. I think all people want their lives to matter. And I want you to understand that in the kingdom of God, we all have an opportunity for our lives to make a difference for eternity. And we don't know who that might be that we influence for eternity, but there are people around us in our spheres of influence that we shape for eternity as we walk with the Lord in a servant's spirit because he uses human instruments. One of my favorite people in the whole world has gone on to be with the Lord. Her name, when I met her, was Iva Hemphill. And she later became Iva Kaiser. Uh, she was a senior adult lady in our church in South Louisiana. I went to that little church. I was about 26 or 27 years old, and Miss Iva was 69 years old. I thought she was ancient. <laughs> no, I didn't tell her that. Uh, I mean, I don't have a lot of sense, but I had enough sense not to say, oh, you're old, you know. And now I'm looking back, and to me, somebody 24, 25 years old is a baby, you know. And, and I kind of wonder, uh, sometimes she's sitting there listening to me preach and says, oh, Brother Rick, that was a great sermon. That was the most gracious human being I've ever seen in my life. There was a church full of them that they believe their calling was to help young ministers get established and move on in their life. That was one of the DNA things in the, in the life of that church. Well, Iva and her husband, Jimmy Hemphill, moved to South Louisiana in the in the early 1940s, like 1939, 1940, from New Mexico. She grew up on a ranch in New Mexico, 75 miles from the nearest town. They went to town twice a year. 
And when they first moved there, she owned and operated what was called the rolling store. Now, we only see this in movies today. But Iva owned and operated the rolling store, and she drove that wagon with that store. It was a rolling uh, store of merchandise, opened up the sides, and people would come out and shop, or she'd stop at their house. It was the original mall in Bush, Louisiana. But anyway, she knew everybody in the community. She knew their their family, she knew their children, their grandchildren, she knew their dogs and, and cats. I mean, she knew everybody. And whenever a newcomer moved into the community, Iva would bake a pie and take them and take them a pie. And she didn't go there to build her business. She went there to build the church. And she would invite them to the Jerusalem Baptist Church. And so I get there in 1982, and I'm talking with people, you know, when would you come to the church? Iva invited me. She brought us a pie and invited us to church. I asked this other, when did you come to Jerusalem Baptist Church? Well, Miss Iva ran the rolling store, and she came by our house, and, and one day she came in her car. She wasn't in the store. She brought us a pie, something as simple as a pie. I'll have you know, when I got to Bush, Louisiana, I probably weighed 140 pounds soaking wet. It's been a long time since I weighed 140 pounds in any description. Her pies are part of my problem. <laughs> Let's just face it like it is. It's Christmas. Let's eat. Okay? But I want you to know that her status in that community, in that church, was unquestioned. But it wasn't because of her age or affluence. She may or may not have been affluent. I don't know. She and, she and Mr. Jimmy lived a very simple life. But her status was unquestioned because of her servant's heart and a gift of godly wisdom that had been exercised for decades so that two generations of people in that church were there because Iva brought them a pie in the name of Jesus. And I want you to know that whatever station you may occupy in life out there, that is of no use in the kingdom of God unless you have surrendered that to the Lord Jesus Christ. And unless you have willingly embraced this servant opportunity that the Lord calls you to through faith in Christ. The Apostle Paul spoke to the Philippian church and he said, Paul and Timothy bond servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you, in the name of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Philippians 1, 1 and 2. Interesting word there. Paul and Timothy, bond servants. That word in the Greek is the word doulos. It is a bond servant, one who has voluntarily surrendered themselves to a master for life. And that's our calling. Your calling and my calling. The same calling. My calling is no different from yours. My gifts in the Spirit may be different, but my calling and your calling are exactly the same. To give ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and become, as was Paul and Timothy, the doulos of God. Live out servanthood in this life and look toward rest in the next life but realize that what we do in this life has eternal significance. So how do you respond? First, by giving yourself to the Lord. Search your heart. And if there's anything in your heart that keeps you from being a servant, ask the Lord to forgive you of it and then move on with a servant spirit. And then answer the call of Jesus to whatever opportunity he puts in front of you. And then look for those opportunities to voluntarily bless those around you. It's Christmas season, a season of giving. 
Christmas is more about giving than about getting in the secular way that we think about it. All too often we're conscious of the getting, but the scripture tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. Stand with me, if you will, as we pray. Brad is going to come and lead us as we close. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you to those who are worshiping with us online. Our prayer is that the Lord blesses you and your family. And in this message today, our prayer is that we see the servant opportunity of the kingdom as a gift of God's grace. Let us embrace it freely. Eternal Father, we thank you that you hear us when we call on you. We thank you that you love us without judgment, that you bless us freely without restraint. I pray for each one here today that you would fill their hearts with the knowledge of your love and with the peace of your presence. Whether they're here with us in the facilities or with us online, we trust, Lord, that during this Christmas season, your gift of grace shown in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ would fill the lives and hearts of all who seek you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.